Welcome to the next episode in the CIC 280 Introduction to Cybersecurity series. Today we're talking about authentication and in particular attacks against common authentication schemes. In the previous video I explained that authentication is a two-step process that begins with an assertion of identity or a claim of identity which then should be followed up with some form of evidentiary information to substantiate that claim. The evidence presented to support the claim of identity can exist in different formats or factors as we know them. We recognize something we know, knowledge-based authentication, something we have, token-based authentication, and something we are, biometrics. And we also briefly mentioned the fact that sometimes a location, like a, a geolocation or an IP address is used in determining authentication this, uh, outcomes as well. We also said that for an authentication process to be strong, um, we should at least incorporate two of these factors into the decision making, um, which may lead then to a strong authentication scheme. What I want to do in this video is talk about some of the ways that we can bypass single factor authentication and try to explain exactly why we want these multiple factors in there. Let's start with passwords. Passwords are a shared secret, again, which is not a secret at all because it is shared. Um, and most commonly we ask individual people who want to authenticate to a system what they want their passwords to be. And in other words, that means that passwords depend on the creativity of people. And unfortunately, most people are highly predictable and not terribly creative. Which means that if an attacker is able to get into the same mindset as the person whose credential they're trying to obtain, it's often fairly easy to you know, guess a few passwords and land with a successful one. So, first of all, there are many systems, and um, whether they're hardware or software-based systems, that come out of the box with a predefined default password. Something that needs to be set in the system as an initial password so that um, users can change it once they start using it. You see that as a very common practice, primarily in things like consumer-grade software or consumer-grade Internet of Things devices. The problem with the default password is that in many cases the default password is the same for all devices and all instances of the software. Paired with the fact that we're now going to rely on a person to log in and change the password to something that is hard to guess, which also makes it hard to remember, we'll see that many people don't do that. And that has led to trouble in the past, where we might see uh, big headlines about you know, whatever it may be, some camera getting hacked into and people are watching their baby sleep, um, to um, DVRs that are connected to the internet, to you know, significant infrastructure equipment that makes the internet work, all having these default passwords that were not changed. And in some cases, the default passwords cannot be changed. They were there as a leftover from development or testing and served as a backdoor entrance um, so that a vendor could service. Either way, these default passwords, you have to assume that they are known. And if you have to use them, it should be a default password that is different per device. We see this happening more and more now where, for example, if you get your home internet set up, your router has probably come with a predefined SSID, a wireless network name, but also with a randomly generated password that is affixed to the device itself that you can change, um, but um, that is not the same for all devices and that is a step in the right direction. But default passwords um, are with us for quite a while and they will continue to lead to trouble. So now we don't have to guess at all, but we can also guess um, we can look at um, what common passwords are, for example. We have had so many password breaches over the last 
two decades. And what becomes abundantly clear from those breaches is that people are not very creative when it comes to choosing passwords. We see similar or maybe even the same password used over and over again by the same person, but also by different people. And that means that if we can compile a list of what commonly used passwords are, you know, we can use that list when we start guessing passwords of an individual user's account. Um, the attack that deals with that, where it's basically, hey, I know the passwords, but I have to guess the usernames, is called a password stuffing attack, and it is a very popular attack to see on the internet today. If software or hardware isn't built properly, it might transmit usernames and passwords in clear text, which means that anyone who intercepts that transmission can see what the username and password is. At bare minimum, as you type the password on your keyboard, and someone is able to intercept the signals between the keyboard and the computer's operating system, they know what you typed. But just like that, the computer is probably also going to transmit that password to another computer who is going to validate it. If I can intercept that transmission, and if that transmission isn't secure enough, I also know what your password is, and it is no longer a secret. Even if you do encrypt your passwords, um, and I intercept them, there is a good chance that I can conduct what is known as an offline password attack, where I might take these encrypted passwords and bring them over to my own computer and attack them there. That may take quite a while, but in the end, I will find your password. And once I have your password, there's an excellent chance that you have used that same password for some other service that you subscribe to. So. Passwords can be easily guessed, and even if they cannot be guessed, they can often be reverse engineered. And once they are known, they are known, and there is no additional protection if you're only using single factor authentication. At that point, I know your password, I know your username, I can be you, I can spoof your identity. Of course, I don't have to go so far. I might just ask you for your password. And I could do that in a pretty obvious way, where I walk up to you and say, hey, what's your password? And maybe you'll tell me, maybe you won't. Or I can try to have you sell me your password. Like, hey, if you give me, if I give you a hundred bucks, will you tell me your username and password? How about if I give you a thousand? How about if I give you two thousand dollars? Will you give me your password? Or maybe I'll bribe you with candy. Or worst case scenario, I might put a gun to your head and say, hey, what's your password? And one of these approaches will most likely be successful. That's called social engineering, where you try to obtain information from people or you make people try to make people do things you want them to do by manipulating them one way or the other. And in many cases, attacking the human factor in a secure system is often the most effective one. And there are many ways we could do this. Phishing is an important one and a very familiar one where I might send you email under pretense. I might try to you know, walk into the building with you and you know, most people are polite and they will hold open the door for the people coming right after them. But by doing so, I might be in a secure area where I can observe you. I can look over your shoulder as you are typing in your passwords. Yeah, that will take some training. It's not easy to do, but it is something that you can learn. Or maybe I can hope that you use a public computer somewhere. You know, I might you know, wipe down your keyboard before you use it, and then after you've used it, I might retrieve your keyboard to see what keys you've used, or I may have introduced a key logger in between the keyboard and the computer. There are so many ways that we can attack the human factor in the chain that that is often the most effective way of recovering a password. Now, let's assume that I was not able to in, um, convince you to give you my password. And the, pers the system that you are using was designed using proper encryption, which means that um, I was able to intercept what you were typing, but I cannot understand what it is that you typed. We'll talk about cryptography um, in a later video. Now, what that means is that I now have to reverse engineer from the encrypted text, or if we call it the cipher text, what the original text was, the plain text. In short, there's a couple ways we can do this. One is dictionary-based, like I mentioned before. I could have a long list of words, and whether it's a list of passwords that are commonly used, or whether it is the English dictionary, 
and I can encrypt all of those passwords with all the possible variations that I could find. You know, that would be a very big file. It would take a very long time to do that, but you know, I've got a computer and if I need another computer, I have another computer. If I need a hundred other computers, I rent some space in a virtual machine cloud like Amazon's AWS or Microsoft's Azure or Google's um, cloud computing uh, infrastructure. So computing is easy, storage is easy. And once I have all of those encrypted passwords, I can just compare them to the password that I just intercepted. I make it sound fairly simple. In practice, there are quite some logistical limitations to that, but the principle is clear. If I can create a dictionary of all possible encrypted passwords and map those back to what the original password was, I can intercept an encrypted password, look it up and figure out what the plain text was. That's called a rainbow table attack. Not ideal, but it's more ideal than having to do a brute force attack where I try to encrypt every possible password um, that I can find. And by doing so, I'm guaranteed to find the password that you are using. The problem is even with very large computing resources, it's going to take a very, very long time. And by then, you probably will have changed your password. And at that point, the best I can do is figure out what password you had, not what password you have. Like passwords, tokens can also be attacked, although not as easily. To attack a token, whether it's a memory card, like a swipe card, or a smart card, I will have to have special equipment and I will have to have supplies and knowledge that are not something that you would typically pick up by going to Micro Center or Best Buy. It doesn't mean that that equipment isn't readily available, but it's harder and it will require more expertise. It will also require me to have physical access, at least for temporary, temporarily, to your token so I can copy it, unless I can obtain the information that is stored on your card in some other way and then I can recreate it. But in the end, tokens can be bypassed as well. Now, to bypass both a password and a token, now that becomes a significant amount of effort. I'm not saying it cannot be done, but it is going to be much more time intensive and maybe even harder. That's why the combination of something I know and something I have is a very strong one. Same thing is true for biometrics. We said that biometric systems um, are based on probability. And while it might be very difficult for me to steal your fingerprint or to steal your voice pattern or your face, I might be able to trick the system into presenting another voice pattern or another fingerprint or another face that matches closely enough to yours that the probability aspect of the biometric authentication step will kick in and say, well, it may be not exactly the same, but I'm 65% sure it's that person. Of course, they were wrong, um, but 65% might be within the threshold in which you are being accepted as a valid authentication. So again, biometric systems can be bypassed as well. That's why I want to combine biometric with a token or a biometric with a knowledge-based uh, factor. In the end, the key lesson to this is all biometric, all authentication factors can be bypassed individually. Once you start combining them, it's still possible, but it becomes much harder and much likely to be successful.